a little clip from Groundhog Day. Must be from the Motor Club. That's what we cut out there. If you haven't seen that movie, I forced my sister-in-law to watch it this week, and she said, I don't like Bill Murray, and she watched the whole movie, so it's great. So here's the thing about that movie, if you haven't seen it. So basically, he gets to repeat the same day and figure out uh, that selfishness is what, not what life's about. But here's the truth. You can do all kind of wonderful things for people and miss love. You can use all the gifts God's given you. That's what Today we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 13, which you've probably heard in a wedding. I love to call it the love chapter. Everybody wants in their wedding again. After you've done hundreds and hundreds of weddings. And I'm like, are you sure you want me to read this? Is it so that you can say this is what I'm not going to measure up to? Is that what you want? But the love chapter was written because Paul was talking in 1 Corinthians 11 and 12 about the gifts that God has given us. And basically, you can misuse even the gifts God's given you. And some people won't say that. I've heard people say, well, you need freedom in the gifts. Well, I hear what you're saying, just that Paul doesn't say it. And Paul actually says you need to limit your gifts because you care for other people sometimes. And so when he gets to chapter 13, he's saying, let me show you a more excellent way. Let me show you a better way. Do you remember when you were a kid and you thought you knew what love is? Maybe you had that first crush and you got that little flutter in your heart when you saw that girl or you saw that guy and you were, oh, oh. how many of you can kind of remember your first crush way, way back? And so, uh, uh, you know, people think that and you think, oh, that's love. And looking back, you're like, uh, no. And then you went to high school, right? And you're at homecoming or prom and Lionel Richie comes on, right? <laughs> By the way, if you want to have fun, just, just tell Alexa, if you have Alexa at home, say, Alexa, play the best of Lionel Richie, and you'll be like, man, I know all these songs, if you're old like me. So uh, we did that the other day, and because uh, I was tired of hearing uh, uh, Neil Diamond. Uh, my sister-in-law loves Neil Diamond. <clears throat> you know, some people like Neil Diamond, and other people don't. That's What About Bob? That's another movie altogether. But anyway, so they were playing, uh, you know, that song, and you feel that little flutter, what love is. Let me tell you, we, they, they interviewed some kids to ask them what love was, and so they wrote down their answers. Here they are. Greg, eight years old, love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball's pretty good, too. I know some adults who might say that, by the way. May, age nine, no one is sure why love happens, but I heard it has something to do with how you smell. That's why perfume and deodorant are so popular. <clears throat> Roger, age nine, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> Leo, age seven, if falling in love is anything like learning to spell, I don't want to do it. It takes too long. Bobby, age eight. This guy must have been a Casanova. You got to hear this one. Love will find you, even if you're trying to hide from it. I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but the girls keep finding me. Kenny, age seven, it gives me a headache to think about that stuff. I'm just a kid. I don't need that kind of trouble. <laughs> Ava, age eight, uh, you know, if you're going to get married, one of you should know how to write a check because even if you have tons of love, there's still going to be a lot of bills. I think she is the best answer, really. And then finally, Manuel, age eight, I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something, but the rest of it is not supposed to be as painful. Pretty good, pretty good. So today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 and talk about what love really is. Because the truth is, a lot of people have misconceptions about what love really is. And you can do all these wonderful things, but if you do them with the wrong motivation, with the wrong reason, or do them for show, you really aren't being loving. And it won't last. But if you love the right way, what the Bible calls agape love, we're going to talk about that in a minute, then when you really love people and show people love, it will last for eternity. So let's look at that. Number one, abilities are valueless without love. First Corinthians 13, one through three, if I speak in the tongue of men or of angels, but do not have love. And this word for love here is agape. It's a selfless love. And honestly, I don't believe anybody can really have agape love without the power of the Holy Spirit, because we tend to be selfish and self-centered. You want to find out if you're self-centered? Give somebody a gift, and when they don't thank you, do you get aggravated? Then did you really do it, right? You see what I mean? Okay, so if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Now, we don't have cymbals or gongs. What we have is those irritating alarms. 
And I have a daughter who does not wake up to her alarm. And so second after second, minute after minute, hour after hour, if I did not go and say, do you not hear that? She's going to die in a fire if we're not careful. She needs that alarm that says, get out of bed now. But she can't hear it. But guess what? I can. If you don't love people with real love, true love, you're just being aggravating. You're trying to get something for you all the time. And if you're going around doing things for people, but if you're really doing it to get something from them, it's more like an irritating alarm. And then it continues, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, wouldn't that be awesome? Most people on the internet, you read what they say and you're like, I used to think they were smart. And if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship, it says to the flames in some versions, that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. So even if I become a martyr, and the reason I become a martyr is so I can brag about it, which is kind of a crazy thing when you really think about it, and that's what this verse says, it's for naught. So how do we do things in loving ways? See, too many times we think love is these grand, huge gestures. We think it's the big things that we do. But can I tell you, if you're in a relationship with anybody, whether it's your brother, whether it's your sister, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a relationship at work, if you really want to be loving, listen to what I'm about to say, it is thousands of little things. And oftentimes, it's two parts, which we don't think about. It's, of course, saying, or I, I encourage couples when I do a wedding, texting even, I love you, I care about you. That's kind of the new way, you know. But it's also, ready, ready, not saying or texting. You ever get a text and you replied a little too quick and wish you could take it back? You can't. There's no rewind. There's no, there's no button that you push that you get to go back 10 seconds. So what do you do? You have to learn how to love, which means sometimes you got to know when to hold them. When to fold them. Rogers is one of my favorite philosophers, by the way. Most love, what, most of what the world calls love is self-centered love. If people are real honest about it, it's about us. It's about how we feel. And when we look back to third grade, we kind of realize we didn't know anything about the person that we loved. It really was for us, what we wanted, what we wanted to get, and what we could get from it. Only God can give us unselfish love. I want to I give you just a comparison because love for us oftentimes, if we're not careful, love becomes like the Olympics. You know, the Olympics is going on now and some snowboarder uh, won or something, I don't know. I, I, I grew up in Miami. Snow is very foreign to me, although I heard that Florida sent some of the most winter sports people, which blows my mind. Anyway, so what are they trying to do? They're competing to see who can win. That's normal Olympics. Let me tell you about Special Olympics. My favorite story from the Special Olympics is a 100-yard race or 50-yard race, and the kids were all running to win, and one of the kids fell down and started crying. And before the other kids reached the finish line, they heard that, they turned around, they went back, and together they walked the other child over the finish line. We can learn a lot from special needs children. And if, you, if, if you're honest, if you're not careful, you even think your marriage is a competition. Well, I did this yesterday. You did that today. I did that. Listen, it's not supposed to be that way. It should be, let's help each other. That's why love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have boundaries. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But, but here's the deal. What does love do? It goes back and says, how can I help you? What's the best thing I can do for you? By the way, sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody is say, Okay, get up. <laughs> uh, we got things to do. It doesn't mean enabling them, but it means that you're not trying to win. Do you see the difference? Let me, let me throw out some unloving and loving thoughts. Here they are. I'm forced to use my gifts. And so since chapter 13 really is talking about spiritual gifts, uh, you know, 
this is not just talking about love, exciting and new, right? This is talking about spiritual gifts. How, how can I use the gifts God's given me? Am I forced to use my gift? Am I seeking attention? I only do things so that people notice. And boy, you know how you can tell when somebody doesn't notice, all of a sudden you're upset, right? I'm important. You're not as important. I can't believe I'm the only one that helps around here. Am I the only one that, you fill in the blank, have you ever said that statement? Whether it's at your house or at church? By the way, I think God sometimes does that. If you take on uh, uh, something that you're going to do and you really feel like God's called you to do it, I think sometimes God makes everybody sick at the same time. Because you start and all of a sudden you're like, am I the only one that serves around here? <laughs> I'm a martyr. We just love the martyr syndrome, don't we? Right? We're all important. We all matter. And then finally, reluctantly uh, sacrificing. That's the, I guess, if nobody else will... Well, I guess I have to. Oh, poor you. By the way, we've canceled many ministries at our church because I'm really bad. I'm one of these doofuses that people say, well, I don't feel like doing that anymore. And I go, okay, we won't do it anymore. What? What do you mean we won't do it anymore? Well, if, if nobody's called to do it, we won't do it. Uh, we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'll just get up on the stage every week if I need to. Nobody else share. I'll just come in. We'll walk in. We'll sit down. What? But I love that everybody uses their gifts. Twyla this morning used her gifts so that you could get a cup of coffee. <gasps> Praise God, Twyla. We appreciate your gift of hospitality, right? But there were other people that used their gifts, whether it was to pick up the parking lot or put out some signs or do something little that you never noticed and never appreciated, but God notices. Here's some loving thoughts. I love to serve. One of the best lines I like in, in Groundhog Day is when he says to uh, Andy McDowell, is that her name? By the way, she's the same age as she was during that movie. Bill Murray's aged 400 years. Uh, he says, how can I, how, what can I do for you today? When's the last time you said to somebody, what can I do for you today? And meant it. And didn't say it hoping to get off the hook. I can serve unnoticed. Remembering that we work for the king, not for applause. And then finally, I'm serving Jesus. Let's look at number two. So first, abilities are valueless without love. Number two, love values the other person. So love isn't out of a selfish motivation. Let me read you a selfish letter. Now, you're going to be like, as I'm reading it, you're going to be like, that doesn't sound selfish. Oh, just wait. Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I felt since breaking off our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. Congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> Sound like she has a selfish reason. Anybody guess that maybe? The truth is, when you go to serve, the time that you can recognize whether there's selfishness in you is when something doesn't go as planned. Somebody maybe not only doesn't acknowledge you, but maybe even you get attacked for doing something good or helping somebody. That's when you can realize, am I really doing it for the Lord or am I doing it so I can feel good about me? What does love look like? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. You remember that competition? It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. By the way, this word for dishonor others is a kind of a strange Greek word. It basically is kind of the word askew, which is like, how do you translate that? And, but it means to make other people uncomfortable because you're acting so weird. There are people at our church that when I take them to lunch and I sit down at the table, the first thing I say to the waiter or waitress is, don't pay any attention to anything they say. Because at some time during the meal, they're going to make a very awkward, weird request. A refill on lemonade that's not refill. A refill on french fries. A refill on a hamburger. I mean, just weird stuff, right? And so... Usually what happens is they will say, hey, my hamburger's gone. Is there a refill? And typically the waiter or waitress goes, uh, 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 uh. To which I stop them and I say, remember what I told you at the beginning of the meal? Don't pay attention to them. Because what are they trying to do? They're just trying to make the other person uncomfortable. Some people think that's fun. That's not loving. Let's continue. 
It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered even on I-95, US-1, or I-4. I saw a, a, a report from Miami this weekend where a guy was tailgating somebody, and then he went to pass the guy, and the guy shot at the other car because he was being tailgated. And all I could think was, why didn't you put your window down before you shot? But that was me. Ridiculous. That's how selfish and self-centered we are. People are, you ready? Ready? This is going to freak you out. People are getting in fist fights at Disney World. $110 to get in and getting in a fist fight. You could get in a fist fight for free. It's a crazy world we're in. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. And this word for evil is not evil like you think of Dr. Evil. <laughs> right? This is evil like injustice. And so love sees injustice and it does what's next. It says, it says, but rejoices with the truth. Basically, it likes when the truth comes out and you go, oh, they really were innocent. Wow, I had that one wrong. It always protects. This is the word that means sign up, to cover over. See, the reason people like to gossip is they love to remove that covering. You wouldn't believe what so-and-so did because that's not love. By the way, you get around anybody long enough, can I tell you that you can uncover things and say, well, you should have seen and fill in the blank. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes. Now, now by the way, that word for trust, that's don't, don't use that. We're going to talk about boundaries in a few weeks, okay? So don't use that to let somebody abuse you. That's not what this means, okay? Always hopes, and then I love this last one, always perseveres. Do you know how you find out sometimes if somebody's really loving? When they're tested. You, you can't tell what somebody's like until they're tested. I remember a guy who owned a bus company locally here called me one day and we were talking. I said, hey, how do you know when you're hiring a good employee? You know, how do you, how do you evaluate? He goes, oh, that's easy. I said, really? He goes, yeah, about three weeks after you hire them. No, I want to know before. He's like, you don't always know before. When they're tested, when things don't go well, when things don't, people don't say what you want them to say or do. By the way, everybody's nice when people do what they want them to do. What about when they don't? That's when you find out, am I really loving or not? What happens when you're tested? Now, here's some unloving attributes. Gives up quickly. Mean-spirited and unforgiving. We all know somebody like that. Always comparing, always has a list. Bragging, arrogant, gossip. And put downs. By the way, gossip is unloving. You don't have to whisper loving things. Right? If somebody's whispering about you, they're probably not saying, isn't he awesome? Just so you know. So you don't need the miracle ear to listen in on what they're saying like the commercial because you're going to be very disappointed. Angry and selfish. Now, what is loving? Long-suffering. It means that you're going to do whatever you can in the midst of adversity. Kind and thoughtful. Gratitude, thankful for things. And that inspires other people. Encouraging and yet humble. Affirming and complimenting. Sees the good of or in others. Now, here's a little spiritual gifts test. I just want to show you the, the website. You can Google it if you want. It's uh, gifts.churchgrowth.org. You can go there. For some reason, the, the website didn't make it onto the screen, but it's in your notes if you have it, or you can send me a note, and I'll show it to you. They will ask for your information. I know they'll probably send you spam email, but it's the best free spiritual gifts test I've seen. It takes you about 10 or 15 minutes. If you have never looked and said, what are my spiritual gifts? I want to find out. This is a great test to at least get you started on that journey. All right, let's go up to number three. Loving service is valuable forever. You know, I went to Kristen's uncle's funeral this weekend, and uh, somebody who lives to almost 100 years old has a lot of stories. And I didn't hear stories about work, even though he had a really cool job. He did the movie tones for the movies that were before movies, the movies where they showed the troops and what they were doing, all that kind of stuff. That's what he did in New York. Didn't hear a lot about that. I know he worked on the Chrysler building. Didn't hear about that. You know what I heard about? The moment that he sat down and listened to people. 
And I thought about my childhood, and I thought, what do I remember? I remember when I fell out of a tree, got a limb up into my arm here. I remember going into the house and blood everywhere. It was a lot of fun. My sister screaming at the top of her lungs, which really helped me to cope. I was eight years old. I ended up having to get 72 stitches right here. I'll never forget my dad putting on his shoes, grabbing me and carrying me to his truck, us going to Baptist Hospital, sitting for several hours in the waiting room because they didn't realize how hurt I was until he went and informed the nurse loudly after several hours. And all of a sudden I started hearing the word stat and seeing shots. And my dad stood there. My dad could not stand the sight of blood, but he stood there at my bedside while they stitched me up. And then I was thinking of what was one of my earliest memories. I remember sitting on our back porch and my brother and I, we must have been two or three years old. And I remember my mom bringing us out little sandwiches so we could keep playing. It wasn't a big thing, but it was a caring and loving thing. People are going to remember the love that you give them in the thousands of little things. So this week, focus on that. Let's look at the next verses. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there's tongues, they'll be still. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness, completeness comes. Now, People have translated that, and they changed the translation of it after 1900, or what they believed about it. They didn't change the translation, but they wanted to say, well, that, that was when the Bible was finished. No, nobody ever said that before 1900. This is talking about when Jesus comes back. How do I know it? Because listen to what's next. It's in context. What is in part disappears. And then listen to this. This is probably the harshest thing in 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. What are children like? Selfish, self-centered. Paul's saying to them, hey, grow up. Quit acting like babies. Welcome to life. Life's hard. Yeah, congratulations. You now get a certificate. For now we see only a reflection in the mirror, then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now listen, Paul knew the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, and all the laws, and everything else. He, was, he had the last best teacher. The, the, the final teacher of the oral law was his teacher. And yet he says, I only know a little bit. See, Paul could have been arrogant in his wisdom, and I would much rather have a church that as you learn God's word, it doesn't make you arrogant, it makes you loving. We have to put childish things away. I know in part, I'll know fully as I'm fully known, and these three remain, and this word for remain means move in. They stay. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You can have all the hope in the world. You can have all the faith in the world. But without love, it's nothing. Can we be loving? Paul says to us, hey, it's time to grow up. It's time to quit being a kid and being selfish and self-centered and thinking love is about, oh, she's so pretty. And recognize that love is a lot more than just a, a little flutter in our heart. It has to do with a commitment of caring for people when it's difficult when things are tough. I got a call this week that my uncle, my final, my last uncle is dying. And so one of the things I thought about was, what do I remember about his life? You know what I remember about him other than teaching us how to play baseball? And I always joke that, it, and my brother and I always joke that if he didn't move, we'd be professional baseball players. But it's a total lie, but there it is. I remember sitting out in his front yard. I was probably four years old, five years old. And just sitting, and him sitting with us as little kids, and you ready for this? Talking to us. And listening to us. When's the last time you've talked to a child? When's the last time you put your phone away to talk to somebody? Exactly. If, I know online you couldn't hear the kids screaming from the back. They were reminding us that they're important. When's the last time? 
I want to encourage you this week, do one of those thousand moments and go out of your way this week. And if you're ADD like me, you have to kind of coach yourself. All right, pay attention. Focus, Daniel's son. Look at them when they're talking. You know, all the things. And go and actually listen to somebody. Feel what they're feeling. Love them the way Jesus loved people. One of my favorite verses in scripture is when it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I don't think that's the only time that happened. Can you look at people and love them? Hey, hey, you ready for this? Can you look at people and love them when you don't like them? Yeah, yeah. We have children. We know how to do that, right? Right? When you don't like what they're doing, can you still love them? Yeah. You ready? I'm going to step on your toes. Hang on. Can you see somebody from a different political party that doesn't believe or think like you think and still love them? You, you better be able to. If not, you're not like Jesus. Because Jesus loved people in different political and religious parties. And he cared more about the person than he did about their politics or anything else. Can we love like Jesus? I'll talk about that a little bit more next week. I'm going to do a sermon titled, Jesus Loves You. Here's some unloving thoughts. My gifts, I am the Muhammad Ali of gifts. I am the greatest. I know more than you. I'm fine as I am. That's the Popeye thing. I am what I am. And I'm mature. Now here's some better thoughts, and these are the thoughts that Paul had in that last verse. God can use my gifts. I can learn from you. I need to grow and change, and I am growing in maturity. God, I need to grow. I don't care how far, far along you are in this journey. You've got a long way to go when it comes to love. Paul knew that he did, so guess what? As much as you think you're ahead of the race, when's the last time you picked somebody up and carried them with you? The race isn't just about you. Who can you be loving to this week and care about? That's my prayer for us, that our love would be genuine, that it would be real, and it would last for eternity. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that after the service. I'll be here. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, the fact that Jesus died for you and rose again so that you can surrender to him all of your sins, all your failures, all your faults, and follow him. Maybe you're here today and as I talked, you realize you haven't been very loving. It's okay. God loves repentance. Repentance means a mind change. It means, God, I'm sorry I've been acting this way, and I'm going to do this. That's called repentance. So maybe you need to repent today and just say, God, I agree with you. Whatever area that is. I pray this week that you'll find somebody to go out of your way to just be loving to with no expectation of what they can give back. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word and your power. I thank you for your love for us. Lord, even when we're unloving, even when we are unlovable, you love us. And I thank you for that, Father. Father, I pray as a church that we would grow, especially in maturity, in love, and caring for other people. Lord, help us to walk the way you walked. Help us to love the way you love. In Jesus' name, amen.